chapter 19, climate change and ozone depletion thrown in there for good measure. So when you signed up for this course, you were probably thinking, oh, I'm going to learn about climate change. So here we are. It's something we've talked about a lot um, throughout the year. But this chapter gets into the details of it. Nice case study on melting ice in Greenland. Start you off right away with data. Okay. And it's all about the data and the evidence here. Really important reminder right off the bat. Weather is not climate. Okay. So climate, to really get good climate data, you need a minimum of three decades, 30 years worth of data. So we'll talk more about this, but always keep that in mind. That's the best argument when people say something like, oh, it's really, really cold out, or wow, get a lot of snow, so much for climate change. Okay. Single incidents do not change what we have for decades worth of data showing us. All right. So I like figure 19.2 showing us kind of what's been happening over time. Okay, so the idea of climate change, okay, climate change is not new, right? The climate's been changing, as we can see. So in that graph in the upper left, we have average temperature over the past 900,000 years. So we have all these ice ages, if you will, or the interglacial peri periods. Okay, so we have glacial and interglacial periods. And this is a interglacial period that we are in right now. We've been in since pretty much the um, agriculture was first established, which we can see in the lower left-hand corner. That's the past 22,000 years. But if you look at the upper right hand, that's average temperature over the past 130 years. So you can see, again, fluctuations, but we definitely see a warming trend. And then if you look at the lower right temperature change over the past 1,000 years, um, we can see that, again, fluctuating, 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 but then kind of that sharper increase. Okay, so we're talking about anthropogenic, caused by human activity. That's the climate change that's new. All right, so how do we know about all this historical temperature from hundreds of thousands of years ago? A few ways. Um, my favorite that you can see in the pictures in figure 19.3 is ice core samples. And when ice freezes, it captures air bubbles in it. So they can actually sample ice cores, dig down really deep. They get this big core of ice, which goes back thousands and thousands of years. And then they can sample the air bubbles and find out what the composition of the atmosphere was like, and then they can figure out all sorts of things, such as temperature. Um, also from studying radioisotopes and rocks and fossils, ocean sediment, um, can look at pollen that's collected in the bottoms of lakes and in bogs, looking at tree rings. And then since the mid 1800s, we have actual measurements um, made with instruments like thermometers. All right, so in terms of the greenhouse effect, Greenhouse effect is a good thing. Please remember that. It keeps our planet warm. If we didn't have greenhouse gases, we would be dead. So essentially what happens is solar radiation comes down, hits the earth, and then a lot of it bounces back as infrared radiation. Some of that infrared radiation goes back out into space, but greenhouse gases absorb the infrared radiation and then re-emit it back towards earth. And that's what keeps us warm. Remember our greenhouse gases. Water, right? not super important in terms of what we're going to talk about, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And of course, the one you probably think of most often is carbon dioxide. Methane's also super important. And here we have in figure 19.4, carbon dioxide, methane, temperature, and sea level measurements um, over the past 400,000 years. And you can imagine if you kind of were able to squish all of these onto one graph, there are some definite correlations here. So update here, carbon dioxide levels have now risen to pretty much a steady 400 parts per million at their as kind of peak. In August of 2017, hit the highest reading um, ever at 410 parts per million. And this is mostly due to the combustion of fossil fuels. Also deforestation plays a role, but we look for a primary culprit, fossil fuels. Methane levels are also rapidly increasing. This is, methane is more of a concern in that it's a much stronger, more potent greenhouse gas, um, but we're releasing a lot more carbon dioxide. But methane levels are increasing be mostly due to agriculture, the raising of cattle and sheep, which when they belch, they release a lot of methane. Um, fossil fuel extraction, creation of landfills, and then when everything decomposes, methane is released, and also flooding land for reservoirs. Okay, and permafrost melting, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then nitrous oxide levels are increasing due to a use, increased use of nitrogen fertilizers. Oop, my page is sticking together here. All right, um, 
So the IPCC, which you may have heard of before, um, they're the ones who kind of have all the data. They're not paid, it's just basically thousands of scientists who all work together to um, look at aggregate samples of data and kind of analyze it. Um, so here's an update from their 2014, their fifth report. One of the most important differences compared to what's in the book here in the science focus is that now the IPCC report says that it is extremely likely that humans ha are, have been the main contributor to climate change. So that's the increased their confidence since the 2007 report mentioned here in the textbook. And there's a lot of evidence out there such as the glaciers that you can see here in figure 19.6 and melting of sea ice in 19.7. And yes, there will always be anomalies, but overall what's happening is a decrease in the amount of ice. Okay. Um, the science focus on page 500 does a nice job kind of summarizing the factors that can either increase or decrease, natural factors that increase or decrease, um, greenhouse gases and temperatures, and talks a little bit about modeling. And models are always important to think about, you know, think about how they can't predict weather accurately um, for a week from now. But if you look at this and it explains how the models are used and how some of what the what's actually happening can only be represented in models if you in input human activity. Um, updated 2015 carbon dioxide emissions rankings, China is still number one, USA is two, India three, Russia four. That's from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, their list does separate out the U European Union into separate countries. Um, so in your book, 2009 data, they have the EU as third, um, which they may still be, but notice the biggest jump there is India jumping um, up quite a few spaces there. Okay. There's an excellent TED talk by James Hansen um, from 2012, why I must speak out about climate change. I'm hoping we get a chance to watch that in class. If not, I'll definitely assign it for homework. Um, and then we get some different things here. So one of the arguments that climate change deniers, okay, or they call themselves skeptics sometimes, they'll claim that there's been an increase in solar activity and that's what's increased temperature. But solar output has actually decreased and temperatures are increasing more from the bottom up. So from the bottom of the atmosphere, closer to Earth, upwards, whereas if it was an increase in solar activity, you would see an increase in temperatures kind of the top of the atmosphere first. That's not what's happening. Um, so oceans come in as well because oceans do absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So scientists at one point thought, hey, this is great. Car you know, the ocean can just kind of absorb all this excess carbon dioxide. But basically, as ocean temperatures go up, less carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean water. Think about dissolved oxygen, right? warmer water, DO levels go down. Um, and then also remember that when wa water and carbon dioxide mix, you get carbonic acid and ocean acidification, which we talked about earlier this year, which leads to coral bleaching and a decrease in phytoplankton populations. So that's not good. Um, and then there are some things that can actually help to slow down climate change, like volcanic eruptions and human released aerosols. Those can temporarily lower atmospheric temperatures, um, but it's probably not a solution. We don't want more air pollution and we don't want more volcanic eruptions. All right, so 19.2, possible effects of a warmer atmosphere. There are a lot of them. Um, and we'll get into some of these in class. So one thing is we might see more severe and prolong prolonged droughts. Um, that would therefore increase wildfires and then that could, it could also decrease fresh water availability. Um, we get ice and snow more likely to melt and we get we have a lot of positive feedback loops with climate change. So when there's less ice and snow, you get more of that dark color, the albedo effect. So more solar absorption, and then you get less ice and snow, and so on. Okay. And interesting geopolitical stuff, as the Arctic sea ice is starting to melt, they're actually looking into new shipping channels that have opened up um, through the North Sea. So that's something to think about. Um, another thing to think about, not so good, mountain glaciers, they provide, they're the major source of drinking water for fresh water for about half a billion people. So as glaciers melt and that reliable source of fresh, wa fresh water goes away, that could be another major problem. Um, permafrost melting, I mentioned this before. So as temperature increases, permafrost in the tundra starts to kind of thaw and melt, that releases methane and then that methane causes the temperature to go up more. So again, another positive feedback loop. 
um, sea levels rising. And a lot of times you think like, oh my gosh, sea levels are rising because the ice is melting. Um, not the primary sorry, cause. The primary reason that sea levels are rising is that as water warms up, it actually expands. Um, and then also land-based ice. So an iceberg floating through the ocean melting isn't going to actually raise water levels. But um, like the green like ice sheet on Greenland melting, that could be a problem. Okay. And then please do pay attention on page 507. It gives some specific effects of rising sea levels. Um, you have to go beyond flooding. Okay. If there was like an FRQ, you can just say flooding. Okay. So there's some really nice examples on page 507. We could get more extreme weather. Okay. So warmer ocean waters could lead to stronger hurricanes and storms. So some models suggest we might have fewer of these tropical storms, but they might be much stronger. Okay. And then of course, climate change can threaten different species. So some species are more at risk than others. A lot of it has to do with like the range of tolerance and if they have a limited range and habitat. And then some ecosystems are more at risk than others as well. And then some species might benefit from climate change like destructive insect and fungi species could expand their habitats. Um, or, you know, think about mosquitoes that carry, that are vectors for different diseases could expand their habitats. That's not good for us. Agriculture, another thing, agriculture will actually increase in some places. Um, like Canada, for example, will have a longer growing season. Awesome. But there are a lot of places, especially monoculture crops in tropical areas could face some severe problems. And agriculture is a very large contributor to climate change. So they are contributing and they're really at risk. So when we get into agriculture, you can think about how could we solve these problems? And then we have some health effects of climate change. The fun doesn't stop. We even might see an increase in heat related deaths, could see a decrease in cold related deaths, but more people die from heat related deaths. Um, an increase in disease carrying in insects, increase in asthma and allergies, increase in ozone and photochemical smog, and an increase in climate refugees. So think about if an area is flooded, think about how many people live near the coast, and then where do those people go? They become climate refugees. All right, so the third section of chapter 19